Shalom, Bread TV. Um, you know, since October 7, uh, I was not watching the news and the media uh, because all the media and all the news are uh, using uh, their tools against the will of God. And here is the Bread TV that uh, is using by the hand of God. And I want to give thanks for the Lord that He gave you 10 years of the anniversary and I pray for many, many, many years ahead and fruitful and prosperity for your ministry and breaking through in a tremendous way. I felt to share with you this verse from Isaiah uh, Nunbet, verse 7, uh, Isaiah 52, verse 7. And I will read it for you in Hebrew. It says, Man avu aleharim ragle mevaser, mashmiya shalom mevaser tov, mashmiya yeshua, so it says how, how pleasant it is for the feet of the evangelist, of the person to give the good news and, and brings the peace uh, and, and give the good news and declare salvation toward Jerusalem. So this is what I see that you're carrying in your heart to bring the shalom of God, to bring the good the good news that come from the heavenly. And we all say, Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai, and we all wait for him to return. So, Mazal Tov, Brachot, blessings for the 10 years of the anniversary. This is Guy Cohen from Akko, Israel. Bread TV is, is doing amazing work and the right things for the state of Israel and for humanity. So thank you so much, Bread. Uh, you are amazing continue operating wonderful according to uh, christian values jewish values for a better humanity thank you so much continue with uh, your good work Coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline, preparing for war after Hezbollah's missile attack, killing 12 Druze children at a soccer game. Plus, a front lines report from Julie Stahl near the Lebanese border. And intelligence experts weigh in on Hezbollah's military strength and a possible strategy inside Lebanon. And lending a hand to a widow in need. CBN Partners making a difference all this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu broke away from his war cabinet Monday to visit the Druze village hit by a Hezbollah rocket over the weekend. As he consoled families of the 12 young children killed in the attack, he expressed solidarity with the people and vowed a strong response. Like all citizens of Israel and people across the entire world, we were profoundly shocked by this terrible killing. The Prime Minister also pledged to send a powerful message to Hezbollah. These children are our children. They are the children of all of us. The State of Israel will not and cannot ignore this. Our response will come and it will be severe. Retired Major General Yaakov Ami Dror of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security tells CBN News Israel must take the time it needs to ensure a successful mission. We are not in a rush, not at all. The more it will be prepared, the better. Here we have to retaliate, and the retaliation should be well prepared before you use it. You have to prepare the retaliation and all the arrangements for the consequences of the retaliation. In anticipation of a coming attack, the Associated Press reports Hezbollah is preparing its own retaliation that would involve precision-guided, long-range missiles. The report adds that Hezbollah doesn't want a full-blown war, 
Amidra adds Israel's show of force will indicate what direction it's ready to take. It very much depends on the decision of the decision makers. Do they ready to go to a big war? If the answer is yes, it's a one set of targets. If the answer is no, it's not the right time for Israel for many reasons, from the economy to legitimacy to the ability to fight in two fronts. But if the decision is not to go to a big war and Israel doesn't want to go to a big war, so it's another set of targets. But it very much depends on the decision or the readiness or the willingness to go to a big war. Ami Dror lists key points Israel needs to consider before it chooses a full-scale war, including quality and quantity of ammunition, whether the economy can endure six to nine months of war, domestic and international legitimacy, especially from the U.S., the IDF's level of readiness, as well as the home front. These are the six elements that should be considered before uh, someone is, is saying, yes, I'm ready to go to war. Well, joining us now from Majdal Shams is Julie Stahl, Middle East correspondent for CBN News. Julie, you're up there. It's been the epicenter of certainly news here in Israel and literally around the world. What are you seeing and what are you hearing up there now? Well, Chris, we literally got out of the car, parked the car across the street from the soccer field where the 12 children were killed. Dozens more were wounded uh, just a few days ago. We literally got out of the car. I met a a beautiful man here named uh, Naeem. His name means nice. And uh, he told us that his brother's grandson uh, was wounded and is in the hospital. Nine years old, Rejwan. He's in the hospital, the Ziv Hospital. Uh, He was playing soccer. It's right across the street behind me. You can see the soccer field. You can see the bomb shelter where the children ran to, tried to run to when the when the Hezbollah rocket came. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's the, the town is very, very united. They're in mourning. They're, it's quiet, but they're they're strong. Um, they welcomed us into their home here, showed us all the pictures of the beautiful, beautiful children. Um, you know, it's it's really been a, a rough time for them. They heard the boom, and um, the uh, Naim's uh, sister-in-law, she was telling us that everybody just dropped everything and ran without shoes on everything we just ran across the street uh, to to see what they could do and they were just whether they were medical people or not they were just picking up the wounded and driving them to the hospital uh we know of one particular medic who had to who picked up his own daughter and um she died um oh so you know it's it's uh, it's very very intense it's been an intense time i would say maybe if we can say something good out of it, uh, there's been a lot of unity. Um, there's been visits by Jewish people, visits by Christians, visits by Muslims to this Druze village. Um, you know, the, the Druze are not, uh, they are Arabic speaking, but they are not Muslims. They're Druze. Yeah. So, um, and, and they're precious people. I can imagine with a a village that size, everybody knows somebody who was killed or wounded in that uh, horrific attack. Is is there a sense of, uh, do you see posters around there, uh, wreaths, and uh, when you go around that area? So actually, we, you know, on the way up here, you drive through several of the of the Druze villages and in every one of them. First of all, you see the Druze and the Israeli flags hanging, flying together. Um, and then you see various things on billboards, different, um, you know, whether it's an electronic thing of the, the children that were murdered or their pictures on, on a fence or, you know, a poster of them. And they're all over the place in all the Druze villages. You know, like I said, the people are very, very united. They stand together. They're uh, a, a precious community. Yeah. Uh, describe for people that may not know who the Druze are and what kind of a uh, role they play in uh, Israeli society and other nations as well in the in the region. So, yeah, there's um, I think around 150,000 Druze in Israel. Uh, they have somewhat of a secretive religion that's partially Islamic. It has also some um, some Christianity woven in and various other religions woven together. 
Uh, it's a secret religion. Nobody really reads their book or anything to know what they believe. Uh, and they have Druze communities throughout the Middle East. Uh, Naim, for instance, has relatives in Lebanon and Syria. You know, and those are, are not countries that are friendly to Israel. This particular Druze village, because they're right up on the border, they've chosen not to be Israeli citizens because of the fact that it's, uh, they, you know, they have relatives in these other countries. But they're throughout the Middle East. There are Druze communities. There's a, a very small, but there is a Druze community even in the United States. Um, but, you know, they're very well respected. They very much honor whichever country they're in. And um, they are very much Israeli here. Uh, a few weeks ago, the, the um, National Forestry uh, Department here in Israel dedicated a forest to the Druze soldiers that had fallen so far in the war. So, you know, they're very much a part of the society. And uh, to have something like this happen, you know, this didn't happen to some minority. This happened to Israel. Yeah, that's exactly what they're saying. Just with about 40 seconds left, uh, Julie, how should people be praying for the people up there in Majd el Shams? I would say to pray, you know, pray for their comfort, pray for that they will stay united, pray that Israel will know what to do, how to respond, uh, pray that uh, they'll be protected up here. Uh, that, and that God would really comfort them and heal the wounded. There's a lot of wounded. Uh, Rejwan, like I said, was covered with shrap shrapnel from uh, head to toe, nine years old in the hospital. So pray for their, their comfort, pray for their healing. Okay, great uh, points for prayer. Thank you, Julie. Uh, God bless up Thank there. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Coming up, intelligence analyst Zarit Sahavi on Hezbollah's growing military capability. The Alma Research and Education Center informs the public about life in Israel's north and raises awareness of the threat posed by the Iranian-backed terror organization Hezbollah. Alma's founder, IDF Reserve Colonel Sari Zahavi, spoke with us recently about the destruction wreaked by Hezbollah on Israelis and Lebanese alike. Sari, how would you describe what life is like up on the northern border right now? You know, I used to live in a nice, peaceful town. Uh, I think we went there together in the past. And then... Um, you know, my world became upside down. Uh, it's not quiet anymore. We hear the blasts and the drones and the jets, uh, interceptions. Uh, two weeks ago, I saw an interception above me. These are huge blasts. We have more alerts in the past uh, few weeks, um, specifically where I live. I live nine kilometers from the Israel Lebanese border, and it's just all around us now. Look, it's not Ukraine. It's a few attacks every day between, I don't know, 5 to 15 attacks every day of Hezbollah uh, from Lebanon. But uh, it's impossible to raise kids like that. Like uh, my daughter told me that she doesn't want to live like that. She needs a vacation from living in this area. And it's very difficult as a mother to hear these kind of statements from your kids. How would you assess the strength of Hezbollah even now? Look, clearly uh, IDF uh, attacked uh, thousands of times in Lebanon as well since October 8, uh, trying to damage the infrastructure of Hezbollah in the town, mainly near the border. So it's kind of a, a mirror picture. You have 90,000 Lebanese that were also evacuated from their homes. You have a lot of destruction on the Lebanese side as well. The difference is that the Israeli society cherish life. Well, the, the base of Hezbollah in Lebanon cherished death, and they are saying that very, very clearly, including the, from the mothers to the leaders, they are saying that very clearly. Uh, we didn't see uh, IDF attacks eliminating the capabilities of Hezbollah to launch rockets, as clearly happened yesterday. Yeah. Is that because they're so embedded into the infrastructure there in South Lebanon? 
actually two reasons. I think that because they are death embedded, not only in South Lebanon, this includes Beirut and it, in, it includes the, the Baqa Valley, wherever uh, Muslim Shiites are living in Lebanon, they are the traditional base of Hezbollah. And the second reason it's because they are hiding these rockets inside the, the populated areas, which pose a challenge to Israel to attack. Yeah. And, and do you think Hezbollah is, has uh, missiles there at the Beirut airport and with the city itself? Uh, completely. We published uh, in July 2020 uh, a report uh, that exposed a few tens of, of missile sites in Beirut. And uh, this is clear to us that the strategic uh, missiles of Hezbollah lies in Beirut, of course. Yeah. Right. Anything else you'd like to add, uh, Sarit? Uh, in total, we have 2,500 att attacks of Hezbollah since the war started using rockets. One attack can include 200 rockets using drones, using uh, anti-tank missiles that Iron Dome cannot intercept. This is a true challenge, and I don't think there is one state in the world that would agree uh, to continue to raise children in this kind of atmosphere. And that's why all of us should unite against terror. This is so important that we will work together around that and we will not build on a fictional arrangement that will not be implemented as we did in 2006. Yeah. Zahavi, Zahavi, thanks so much for joining us and, uh, and continue to be safe. Thank you. Up next, Amiyad Cohen on how Israel could break free from the constant threat of Hezbollah and why it must. IDF troops are gathering in the north in the wake of Hezbollah's recent missile strike on the Druze community of Majd shams Major Amiyad Cohen explains why Israel needs to fight Hezbollah soon and to do it differently this time around. Amiyad Cohen, great to be with you here on CBN News. You're head of the Herut Center, a conservative think tank here in Jerusalem. And you wrote an article called The Last Lebanon War in Tablet Magazine. Uh, Tell us your main message here, uh, that why you wrote it. So Israel has uh, a habit to live in a Groundhog Day uh, in front of its enemies. We're in Gaza again and again, going back and forth and raiding in Gaza in the past 20 years and having a deep conflict there. And the same thing in Lebanon since the 70s. We're again in a raiding structure against Lebanon with no real end, end game and outcome. And every time we're getting stronger, Hezbollah is getting stronger. There's, we need to end that Groundhog Day once and for all. Um, and the only way to do that is by understanding the um, strategic, uh, decisive points that our enemies, how they think about it. And the most important thing for Hezbollah in Lebanon is their land and territory. And there's one thing, we can't end the war in the same uh, uh, um, starting point as, uh, um, as we did in the, in the past. So the end game of the Lebanese war, instead of having a third Lebanese war and a fourth one and a fifth one, we have to end this now, the last Lebanese war, with the Israeli border moving to the Litani River. There's two basic reasons for that. A, they need to lose territory and understand we're not playing. You can't go back to square one after starting a war and attacking Israel on October 8th. The second thing is there's no territorial border between Israel and Lebanon today. The border today, the Lebanese Hezbollah, actually, the Iranians, if you understand what's the, uh, the power structure, have an elevated ground uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, over the Israeli towns in the northern border. That's why they are able to shoot anti-tank rockets and to raid. And that's what we're afraid of. That's why we're going to protect the northern border to take over and, and occupy these cities and destroy like they did on October 7th in the south. The Litani River, which is 20 kilometers to the north, is a border that is a barrier that can protect. It's a, a, a cliff of 400 meters tall that will protect us from the ground invasion of Hezbollah operatives. We will need to find, still protect ourselves from the rockets, but the only solution to end this conflict with a very decisive victory by Israel is to telling Hezbollah there's one end for this war. Israel is going to take territory from Hezbollah and from Lebanon and from Iran, and we will have a border to protect us. Wow. You're not only the head of the Harut Center, but you're also a major in the reserves. You've been up there for four months, and you're heading back as well. What have you seen up there on the border? 
So first of all, um, it's devastating to look at the cities that are deserted now, the Israeli cities. There's 82,000 Israeli refugees now left their houses, went back uh, um, to different places and, and hotels in Israel, and the cities are deserted. That's a strategic mistake by Israel, and that's devastating. I lived in some of these cities in the past, and to see empty towns, you can't understand um, how it's a strategic loss for Israel in that perspective. The other part of it is I can see that Israel can win this war. We have a strong army and people are afraid of the Iranian army, Hezbollah, on our border. They're good. I'm not underestimating them, but we're much better, we're much stronger. And this is a message the world needs to understand. Hezbollah is afraid of having a full-scale war with Israel. Because at the end of the day, we have a strong army, we have a strong military industry, we have a stronger country, and we believe in what we do. We can we can win this war and we will and should win this war. We don't want to have a war. We prefer them giving up. But if 1701, the, the UN decision from 2006, is not fulfilled by the UN and by uh, Hezbollah, we need to do that by force. We cannot live with uh, this kind of threat on our northern border. So Israel can win this war, should. The IDF is strong. The soldiers, the reserve armies and the regular army are very, uh, um, let's say, one, they see the cities and they are willing to fight, kill and die to protect our towns. That's why we have the State of Israel, to prevent things like this, like the Holocaust, happening here in Israel. Mm. Final question, uh, Amiad. What's your main message for not only Israel, but for people in the West right now? The battle is not a battle between Israel and Iran. The battle is international between Western Jewish Christian ideas and moral arguments uh, uh, versus the Muslim, either the Sun or the Shiites, uh, um, jihad perspective, that they don't believe that about having, uh, um, let's say, modern, good, moral life. They want to destroy everything the West is building, and they're uh, working together with Russia and with China against the West. And this is only the first attack. And if we, Israel, do not have a decisive victory here in, this, in the northern border and in Hamas and Gaza, this is only the beginning, and it will give them backwind um, for attacking the U.S. and Europe and much more than that. This. Not Israel needs to win this war, but the West has to win this war. And that's why we need the West support, because there's, this is the battle about the Jewish Christian tradition and values against the Muslim jihad who wants to destroy everything that the West built. Well, that's a very sobering, very important message for such a time as this. Amiad Cohen, great to be with you. Thank you very much for having me. Still ahead, faith in action. CBN Israel giving practical support to a Russian widow who found refuge in Israel. The Bible speaks clearly about welcoming the foreigner and caring for widows. The lady in our next story, Mila, a Russian Jewish immigrant to Israel, found herself in a new country, widowed and in the middle of a medical crisis. Thanks to support from our partners, CBN Israel was able to lend a hand. Take a look. Mila was only six years old when World War II started. She recalls the early days of the war in Russia when her father left for the army and her mother evacuated to save their children. My youngest brother was only three months old. There were bombs exploding all around. God spared us. Eventually, Mila married and with her family immigrated to Israel, since they were Jewish. Over the years, she made a life for herself, but it wasn't easy, especially after her husband passed away. My budget is very limited. I cook simple food. After years of financial struggle and loneliness, Mila met the team from CBN Israel. To help her out, we gave her bags of groceries and invited her to join other seniors to socialize and eat healthy meals at a center supported by CBN Israel. We also helped Mila pay for the cost of medical treatment she received during an overnight emergency. I was taken by ambulance to the hospital with very high blood pressure. I felt very ill and thought I was going to die. Some of the trip costs, hospital charges and medicine I had to pay for out of pocket. Thanks to you, CBN Israel paid the cost for the ambulance, hospital, and medicines Mila needed that were not covered by her insurance. I'm so thankful that you're helping me. I owed a lot of money. The bill was very high. 
I have to take expensive medicine that I bought with your help. It was even enough to buy a new blood pressure monitor. From World War II survivors to new immigrants to Holocaust survivors, you make it possible for CBN Israel to help them all. I feel honored by the kindness of the people who support me. It's hard to keep back the tears. I'm so grateful that they haven't forgotten the tragedy we lived through. May God bless them and grant them a long life. What a nice story. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember to follow us on social media, and you can access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blast, and please continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for all those caught in harm's way, and for the return of the hostages to get home. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.